Hey everybody, uh, today we're going to talk about motivation. Uh, we're going to look at the biological uh, theories on motivation, and you want to be able to describe these theories, uh, motivation theories based on biology, and describe the strengths and criticisms of these theories by the time you're done with this uh, video clip. Remember to use your notes, uh, pause and rewind if necessary, and um, we will see how much you know when you get back to class. So good luck, and let's see what we got going on here today. So as we talk about motivation, um, remember no theory causes a behavior to occur. Theories only attempt to explain behaviors before, during, or as it occurs or after a behavior. So when we talk about these theories, don't mistake the theories for being causes of behaviors. Uh, keep that in mind. So uh, I like this little picture here. Um, remember, motivation does occur in all shapes and sizes. Uh, some people are motivated to succeed and other people are motivated to just get by. It's a very complex uh, system. So remember, there's probably no one theory that best explains motivation, but collectively, uh, the theories probably do a pretty good job of explaining why people exhibit certain behaviors or not. So stay up and uh, again, pause if you need to and get those notes out. So by definition, uh, motivation is a need or want or interest that arouses, uh, sustains and directs behavior towards successful attainment of goals. It energizes people to act and it kind of moves you from this resting state or a disinterested state to an active state. Um, it organizes your behavior and, and, and directs it towards a specific goal. Sometimes till the goal is achieved, sometimes not. But it, it does, um, motivation does move us from kind of a sedentary state to an active state. We're going to look at biological explanations in this first video. Where does our energy to engage in behavior come from biologically? And the first theory we're going to look at is the instinct theory. The instinct theory basically says that we're motivated by our inborn, involuntary behavioral responses. Um, these are automatic, unlearned patterns of behavior, and they, they tend to be triggered by the presence of some sort of environmental stimuli. For example, um, fish, salmon, salmon swim um, upstream uh, to their place of birth when it comes time for spawning season. This isn't something they ask directions for. This is just an innate pattern of behavior. Birds flying south for the winter or north in the summer would be another example. And, and how they fly, for example, geese, what formations they fly in. These are instincts. These are not something that they have to learn. Um, babies, for example, are born with this ability to cry, and this helps them to survive. You might have heard of the rooting reflex, the ability to search out for food. Um, and instincts only explain why a small fraction of our behaviors occur. They don't explain most of our behaviors, just a few things. Um, for example, biological theories on motivation probably would not do a good job at explaining why somebody would want to jump out of a perfectly safe airplane for fun. So keep that in mind. They don't explain all behaviors, just a small fraction. First theory we're going to look at is the drive reduction theory. Um, this theory says our behaviors are motivated by internal discomfort. Um, these are biological needs. Um, we, our body attempts to maintain homeostasis. And homeostasis is our biological tendency to want to keep our body in a state of equilibrium, balance, if you will. When we are not in balance, we have a need internally that creates a push or a drive. Now, a push is a, a desire from within that kind of moves us towards um, satisfying that need, and, and that is considered to be a drive. Clark Hall, was, in the 40s, early 40s, came up with this theory, and, and he basically said that 
many of our motivations are caused by disruptions to homeostasis. For example, when we are tired, we sleep. We, we feel this overwhelming motivation to put our head down and go to sleep. When we are hungry, that uncomfortable feeling in our stomach, we are motivated to take in sustenance. I like those pancakes. And when we feel the need to go, we got to go. And there's not a lot of things that are going to interfere with that um, drive, that push, if you will. Another biological theory is the arousal theory. Um, this was um, thought up by Hebb in 1955. And it's a, another biological-based theory that says people are motivated to act in ways that keep them at their optimal level of arousal or their most comfortable level of arousal at that time, often referred to as OLA, optimal level of arousal. And the optimum level varies from person to person and from time to time. Uh, this kind of parallels the yerkes dotson law. And the yerkes dotson law suggests that for any task we can perform, there's a level of arousal here on the horizontal that will allow us to perform our best. And if our arousal level goes too high, our performance level goes down. And it depends on the situation. If we're doing something simple like tying our shoes, we can afford a lot more arousal and still do well. But if we're trying to take a test, a little bit of arousal could really sink us in the long run. So our need to just go out and run around and be goofy might be really high at some times. Uh, and that's what we need to, to be comfortable. Um, some people may be motivated and they need a high level of arousal to achieve great things. And sometimes we might just be sitting there and we just don't want to do much. So that might be our optimal level of arousal at that time. Now, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is kind of a unique example, biologically speaking, because it probably fulfills both uh, biological and cognitive needs. But if we look at the, uh, the pyramid, now some pyramids you see five needs, um, some you see seven, some eight. And basically what this theory suggests is Maslow, the, the humanist, remember, said we're motivated by needs and, and not all needs are created equal. And that lower level needs are, need to be met before higher level needs become motivating to us. So if you look at the needs that are lower, you'll see that there's physiological and safety needs. These are really important needs that must be met before we can think about being in relationships or think about completing our schoolwork. And certainly these lower needs must be met before higher level needs such as self-actualization, being all we can be, or even transcendence. Um, notice there's very little space on the pyramid for transcendence and self-actualization. These needs are most easily thwarted or blocked by lower level needs. So. Um, there's a lot of criticism of this. For example, it doesn't explain why people go on hunger strikes. Um, let's go back here for a second. It doesn't explain maybe why um, people risk their lives for um, that optimal level of arousal. If we go back even further and we get back to this arousal theory, it doesn't explain that. Um, at least uh, in, in the correct order. So... Uh, there's a lot of people that agree that these lower level needs are more important, but sometimes we put those those lower level needs on Maslow's theory behind us uh, or at the bottom. So um, let's jump ahead here quick, um, get through Maslow's needs again. And notice some of Maslow's needs are biological, like physiological needs, like hunger needs, and many of them are cognitive needs, such as knowledge and understanding and aesthetic needs. So there are some criticisms here of the biological approach um, that it fails to consider cognitive influences, what our thinking is, what our beliefs are, what our expectations are. For example, money motivates some people to accomplish great things, um, to accomplish large amounts of wealth, but some other people are, are, are more motivated to volunteer, that they see others need and they feel that their needs outweigh their own in some cases. So we might do things for free just for the betterment of society. Um, Gandhi being on a hunger strike, for example, 
doesn't necessarily match the biological approach. So there are criticisms. Um, in the next video, we will look at cognitive needs of motivation. So again, uh, good luck here, and hopefully we helped you out understand some of those biological needs, and we'll move on to cognitive theories of motivation next. Thanks a lot.